The following research looks at how to address construction waste. The work highlights the underlying issues and documents a series of deconstruction-based experiments looking at how the architect can resolve issues of waste and overconsumption in the building industry. The research is primarily driven by this, the core of waste representing the average landfill in developed countries where more than 50% of all waste is from the construction and demolition sectors. This incredible volume of waste is a consequence of modern building techniques, where many materials are selected for their economic reasons for how quickly they can be installed and how cheaply they can be manufactured. The result is the extensive integration of single-use materials and adhesive-based fixings. Plasterboard, wire nails, silicon, reinforced stucco, building paper, expanded foam insulation, structural plywood. This as well as the current legislation that prevents the structural reuse of timber, means that almost all of modern wall assemblies head straight to landfill. In fact, only 12% of a house built today can be directly reused, without any reprocessing or remanufacturing. So what can the architect do to reduce end-of-life building waste? And more specifically, how can residential housing in New Zealand be better designed for deconstruction to ensure maximum end-of-life material reuse? When this issue of waste in the building industry is cross-examined as a consequence of architectural design, we can begin to assess where and how the architect can address these issues. Waste is produced through all stages of a building's life. The specifications of architects affect waste produced by material manufacturers at the construction site and at the end of a building's useful lifespan. The largest quantity of waste is produced within this end-of-life demolition renovation period. Here the amount of materials that can be salvaged and reused depend almost totally on the decisions made by the architect at the time of design. Material finishes, fixings, formal characteristics, and structural configurations all influence the deconstructability of a building. In residential housing, 50% of all the raw materials goes into the structural frame. The structural system selected will also usually dictate the choice of material finishes and how they are fixed. This suggests a hierarchy of deconstruction and that by reconsidering the structural design, we may be able to make significant advances towards a dwelling designed for deconstruction. And although the steps to achieve deconstructability are intuitive, simplify fixings, remove the need for specialist machinery, allow fixings to be removed without causing damage, etc., etc., they intersect with complex economic, aesthetic, legislative requirements were resulting in a complex architectural design problem heavily influenced by the time and costs of deconstruction itself. A large part of designing a deconstructible building is ensuring that its formal characteristics make it attractive to reuse after its first life. This also requires fixings to be used in a way that don't damage the principal materials. Modulation addresses these criteria and is an established solution. Concrete blocks, and in particular clay bricks, are commonly reused module-based building materials. Traditionally, these clay bricks were bound together by lime mortars, a material that is softer than the brick itself. Therefore, when the building that these bricks clad reached the end of its useful life, the bricks could be broken away from the mortar and directly reused. Today, however, bricks are bound by concrete mortars. This concrete is harder than the clay brick and thus the material is damaged and must be landfilled. This issue is at the core of deconstruction design, the relationship between the material and its bonding. So what happens when you do away with the need for a binding agent between materials? What happens when the material itself is self-bonding and self-separating? Timber interlocking module construction is not new, and although the system is highly modular, repeating and flexible, this construction technique is extremely labour-intensive and arguably results in negative economics. And it is not good enough to simply scale up the interlocking module in an attempt to improve time efficiency. Large interlocking panels often require specialist machinery to manoeuvre them into and out of position. This requirement, again, limits the potential of modularity as a solution for designing for deconstruction. 
Analysis of simple interlocking modular geometries in terms of their deconstruction potential highlights critical real-world feasibility issues that underpin this research. Structural integrity, water tightness, and aesthetic demands must be addressed before a building designed for deconstruction will be successful. There are very few systems in the market today that address the notion of deconstruction, even indirectly. Architects don't like to plan for the demise of their hard labour. However, Chris Moller's ClickRaft is an interesting modern system that begins to address ideas of deconstruction. This click-together wall has been proven to work in the real world. It is highly modular, it uses no irreversible fixings, it's quick to erect, and it's easily transportable. There are deconstruction-related issues, however. The long-life use of this construction is not proven. If the material was to deform due to the constant tension loadings, it may be unusable. Yet another modern innovation that has deconstruction potential, although not specifically designed for this purpose, is Auckland University's EDFAB plywood cassette module. This system is quick to erect, without any additional fixing materials, and again, it's highly modular and easily transportable. The locking pins are excellent erection tools, pulling panels into alignment and tightly bonding two elements together. Trying to separate these pieces, however, is a different matter. The tension that this locking plug relies on prevents easy removal. The material around the plug is often damaged when attempts are made to remove it. A cassette system, although offering great modularity, is likely a single-use technology as cladding layers are fixed conventionally to the interior and exterior surfaces of these panels. The issues found with this cassette system in regards to deconstruction and reuse centre around the concept of layering, how different fundamental building systems are laminated together. This layering issue can be addressed architecturally through the separation of structural and non-structural elements. This early concept model proposes creating a fully modular and redundant grid in which lightweight panels forming enclosed spaces are bolted. This solution presents its own set of deconstruction-based issues. To create a 3 metre bidirectional grid, large structural steel members are required. These require specialist fabrication and are very difficult to handle and likely challenging to fix to. Large elements like this, however, make good economic sense to reuse, as their value remains high versus the use of many smaller modules. It is difficult to imagine also how materials will be reused to create a different formal language. To improve handling, the grid system could be scaled down. This approach is similar to F3 Design's art box in Christchurch, where a double-cubed welded frame is hoisted into position and internal linings are bolted to the pre-drilled holes. This system is good in terms of its deconstruction, but again, oversized components and a fixed grid make it the structure expensive and potentially unattractive to reuse at the end of its first life. A logical iteration from here is to break down the grid into a massively modular system, this navigates the transportability and handling issues and makes the resulting form vastly more flexible. Four basic components can be used to assemble a 3x1 grid, expandable in all four directions. Cladding panels and surfaces can then be layered in clips between the frames which are inherently braced. The frame is easy to disassemble and depending on the final jointing system selected, it could use sacrificial timber pegs or a reusable steel bolt. The modules come apart into easily handleable sections with the potential of being reused endlessly. The exposed assemblies and the way in which the pegs are inserted gives a clear logic to how the structure could be disassembled. This proposed modularity transforms the structural system of a residential dwelling into a totally reusable waste-free building system. Such a modular construction method however does not fully solve the issue of layering and reusing wall linings and claddings. Likewise, if the proposed system is manufactured from steel members, fabrication is costly, and harsh chemicals are needed to ensure the longevity of the structure. This issue has been somewhat addressed in a concept wall designed by Guy Marriage. Using a low energy material such as plywood, CNC fabrication can be used to form a click and snap based interlocking wall joint system. The original proposal uses three principal members to create a rigid plywood frame where linings could be screwed into the horizontal and vertical members. 
A deconstruction-based improvement is to integrate a system that allows the linings to be attached without the need for screwing or any type of fixing that damages the attached linings. This experiment deals specifically with how you would build a wall that could be assembled and disassembled infinitely. Plywood pins working in pairs clamp linings to the exterior of the wall. An additional plywood plate protects the linings from damage caused by the tension exerted by the pins. This results in no damaged linings and no damaged structure, and high levels of modularity. This is good progress. However, the system is overly complex and requires specialist CNC fabrication. In an effort to understand the issues caused by over-design, a one-to-one -one model has been built. This model begins to critique the assembly's technical weather tightness capabilities and concerns regarding modularity at a larger scale. Some of the buildability issues become immediately clear, like the near impossible task of cutting a square hole in the centre of a large sheet of cladding. Likewise, digital fabrication results in very, very snug interlocking components. These become difficult to remove and as such can become damaged. A frustrated builder is likely to be not as gentle or as patient as a scrawny architecture student. The interlocking components create a strong and highly reusable wall, while adding a lot of complexity, fragility and custom fabrication to the mix. Damage and marking is visible after only five deconstruction cycles. Bolty is another take on a fully compressed wall system that attempts to add simplicity through the use of a more common, durable and well understood fixing type. Using a steel U section, this wall assembly concept includes a sacrificial untreated timber rain screen, nylon washers, and a layer of 6mm treated plywood sandwiched beneath a smaller plywood section lined with rubber to complete the waterproofing layers. The result is a system that is significantly faster to unbuild. Unscrewing the bolts releases the cladding, cavity spaces and waterproof lining from the main structure. Galvanized steel arms hold the cladding in place through compression, ensuring the sacrificial screen can be composted without processing or contamination. Small clips release what would likely be a 12mm untreated plywood internal lining. Although the system may be more builder friendly, complexity in the spacing and clipping of components, as well as the added expense of a custom metal formed U section, adds significantly to upfront costs. These issues of limiting specialist fabrication and reducing complexity are at the core of designing for deconstruction. Further construction and aesthetic-based issues also significantly constrain many deconstruction solutions. Understanding the role of architecture in the production of construction waste and how potentially it can limit or reduce waste has positioned this research. Existing responses and analysis of a range of building options that are not necessarily known for deconstruction but exhibit qualities of such practices have heavily influenced this work. Responding and understanding the array of issues associated with deconstruction led to this relentless process of modeling digitally, fabricating physically, and then unbuilding. The comprehensive review of these solutions now and over the next week will lead to the development of a more tangible architecture. From this point, the plan is to work towards a complete integrated deconstruction solution. This integrated solution will go beyond designing one dwelling so its components can be reused. By designing two or more of contrasting architectural styles, the design for and design with process can be tested. This process will form a design investigation loop where any changes to one building will directly affect the other. The series of tests documented here today will form the basis of this loop design process. Simply, two houses or buildings of contrasting styles that use the same bits, one after another, will be designed. Formal characteristics will be based on reuse potential, reuse economics, and aesthetic expectations.